Hello, my fellow gnomes. How are you all doing? Now, today we're going to be traveling back a time in a little bit, or backpedaling anyway, because this is something that I actually meant to cover previously. So it's been pointed out to me that episode 5 on functions doesn't really tell the whole story. Now, I actually meant to make a follow-up to that video, but then I ended up forgetting and going on to episode 6 and so on. So I want to talk a little bit more about functions, specifically something called returning. So if I open up this function script we created at the time, we can see we have this function called add, and then we call that function, and it has these two parameters, a and b, and so we provide a value for it, 10 and 22, which then will print out the total of adding them both together. So if I run that, then I would see 10 plus 22, 32. Right, pretty straightforward. Now instead, let's say I didn't want to print it out straight away. Maybe I wanted to send back the value so I could do some more uh, calculations with it. Let's say I have another function here called multiply. And multiply doesn't take any parameters. Well, maybe it takes one parameter, okay? And all it does is multiply, takes that value, and it multiplies it by 10, and then it prints it out, okay? Now let's say I wanted to add two numbers together and then multiply them. There'd be no way for me to do that. So that's where returning comes in. So instead of just printing out A plus B, I can return, or I create a variable, local result equals A plus B, and then I can return the value of result. So you can think of return as like throwing back data, okay? So we're throwing it back to whatever line we originally called the function on. Now, if I want to capture that data that's being thrown back at me, I need to create a variable so I can catch it, catch it in my net. So I'm going to say local result equals whatever is thrown back from us. And then with that result, I am then going to call the multiply function. So now I can say multiply and I'll just put in result as my parameter. So the total of that is going to be 32 and then we're going to multiply it by 10. So if the laws of mathematics still work yet, yeah, we've got 320. Very good. And if you want, you could even uh, wrap this all in together. So instead of doing result and then doing that, I could actually control X and I can call the function within the function like that. That might look a little bit odd, but all that's happening here is we're going to call this one first. Okay. It'll get the result of that. That'll be with thrown back to it, which is going to be 32 in this case. And then it's going to call this function and if you think about it, really, this is what we've been doing already. For example, when we use print, that is a function. So I, instead of using my multiply one, I could do print. And I could wrap the print function with this other function. And I could output that. And I would get 32 again. So there we go. There's some returning. It's pretty straightforward, this. Uh, another thing that um, you can do in Lua, you can't do this in all languages, but it's pretty handy. You can actually return uh, two values at the same time if you want to. So um, if I did this, add 10, 22, I'm actually just going to get both of those values returned back to me. Look, 10 and 22. Uh, now, this is pretty useful returning. So if we come out of this and we go into our team outfit changer script we looked at in the last episode, I think it was. This script uses the player added and character added event. And as soon as the character joins, it creates some new shirt and pants and then it adds them to the character. Now, there is one problem with this. So if I click play, you will notice that when I join, if I look at my character now inside the workspace, click on name code here, I've actually got two pairs of pants, which isn't really ideal. Uh, I've only got one shirt because uh, my character doesn't wear a shirt. But if your character has a her shirt, then you'll see two pairs of each. Now, if I was to delete one, uh, then the problem you'd have is you sometimes you can load in. So if they don't render quite right, you can have one render first, and then you might end up not actually wearing the kit, which is obviously a problem. 
So what we really want to do is we want to check if the character contains a shirt and pants. And if they do, then we want to destroy them before we can add in our own. So above all of this, we're going to use a Roblox function now. So we create a variable, local shirt exists. And we're going to use this to capture the result of this Roblox function. So we're going to say character find first child brackets, quotation marks, and then we're going to type what we're looking for, which is a shirt. So what this does is a function that's going to look through the character model. If it finds anything called shirt, then it's going to return that object. So then this will equal true. Now, if it doesn't find anything, uh, then this will just equal nil. Okay. So we can then check the value. So if shirt exists, then, and all we want to do in this case is we want to destroy it, destroy that shirt. And then we can do the exact same thing for the pants as well. So I'm going to create a new bit down here. And all I'm going to do is just rename this to pants exists and copy and paste them over. And obviously where it says find first child, we need to change that to pants. Now, one more change I'm going to make is I'm going to change this event from character added to uh, character appearance loaded. These two events are pretty similar, but the character added event is fired as soon as the instant that the character starts loading. Whereas character appearance loaded just waits until all of their shirt and clothing and hats and you know all the appearance is loaded in. So it's a good idea to use this event if you're doing anything appearance related. So now we've done that, let's uh, run our game and see if that's working for us. So it all looks the same as before, but now if we check the character, we will see we've only got one pair of pants with not wearing two at the same time. So that's good, we've fixed that problem. Now that's the return keyword covered and a use for it. Uh, there's one more thing I want to quickly touch on, uh, which is something called break. So let's delete all this. And if we're using a loop, so we could have a while through loop, do it, okay? And we just print, hello. So if I have a very basic loop like this, it's just a while true loop. So it's going to keep going and going and going. It's never actually going to stop. So if I had some more code down here, say I had a message like print goodbye, right? Then I'm never actually going to get to that point because this loop is going to keep repeating. So if you, I run that, you can, uh, you can see this in action, just going to keep saying hello. I'm never going to get that goodbye message. Let's say I want to actually exit the loop. How do we do that? Well, we do that using the break keyword. So that breaks us out of the loop and then we can get to our next lines. So in this case, if I run this, you see it's going to print hello just the once and then it's immediately going to break and it will get to our goodbye. So it's not actually going to repeat the loop. This is very handy to use and we're going to be looking at how we can use some of these things I've just talked about in our next episode now, which I think may be our final episode is we're going to start to bring everything together. So certainly don't miss it. See you in the next one. Goodbye.